Hi, this is Larry Varvel here at First United Methodist Church in Broken Arrow with the second lesson in the series Islam and Judaism, Palestine and Israel. This is a series that uh, I'm teaching here on Wednesday evenings. Many folks ask that uh, we do this on a tape so that those who couldn't make it on Wednesday nights would be able to share in some of this information. Uh, last week, we began this with the birth of Islam. And just to recap for a couple of minutes, the birth of Islam, of course, begins with this man, Muhammad. Uh, Muhammad, born in the 6th century, orphaned at six years of age, taken in by an uncle, uh, travels with that uncle throughout Saudi Arabia, what is at least today Saudi Arabia, the Arabian Peninsula, has contact with both Jews and Christians, even though Arabia is primarily a polytheistic, what we would call pagan culture with a multitude of gods. The seminal event in Muhammad's life is when he's 25 years old. Because of his distaste and really hatred for the religion around him, this polytheistic religion, as he was born and raised in the city of Mecca, that he says that he went into a cave where the angel Gabriel spoke to him, told him that he was a prophet of God, indeed the final prophet of God, and the angel Gabriel began to dictate to him the words of what would become the Quran. Uh, Muhammad memorized those words, repeated them to someone who could write them down, and this process continues for 22 years of him having these encounters with an angel, memorizing the words, reciting them back, they're written down, and that recitation becomes the Quran, the holy book of Islam. The word Quran means recitation. Not only does Muhammad see himself as the messenger and prophet of God, but he begins to preach this message to first the people of Mecca. He then moves to the city of Medina, where he gets a much better reception. Many people join his new faith, his new religion. He is not only a spokesman and a preacher, but a military leader, a political leader. He gathers an army. Uh, he brings 10,000 men with him back to Mecca, conquers the city of Mecca, becomes its ruler, and within one year is the ruler of the entire Arabian Peninsula. And all of the Arabian Peninsula has become part of this new religion of Islam. Just a reminder that Islam is a word in Arabic that means submission. Submission. Uh, someone who is a follower of Islam is called a Muslim one who submits. And so we talked last week about Muhammad's life, about his uh, encounter that he says that he had with the angel, about the uh, creation of the Quran, uh, about the stories about Muhammad that are not in the Quran, but are in what are called the hadiths, the legends of Muhammad, the stories about him, his visit in the middle of the night to Jerusalem, his visit to the throne of God, uh, the many stories surrounding the legend and the life of Muhammad. Muhammad becomes the most powerful man in the Arabian Peninsula, and at the height of his power in 632 AD, he dies. He dies in the arms of his wife. The problem with that is he did not leave clear instructions as to the succession. Uh, there is no clear game plan for who would succeed Muhammad as the leader of the people called Islam. Now let me stop there for a moment and let us know something about this idea of Islam. Islam is growing rapidly during Muhammad's life, and it is ever, ever expanding. One of the principles in the Quran is that the world is divided into two halves, as it were, two areas. One is called Dar al-Islam, Dar al-Islam. And all that means is the world of Islam, the realm of Islam. The rest of the world, according to the Quran, is called Dar al-Harb, Dar al-Harb. That means the realm of war, the realm of contention. And it is the responsibility of every Muslim to spread Islam, to bring the entire planet under the control of Islam, so that the entire world will be Dar al-Islam. And everywhere that Islam is not in control, 
Muslims have the responsibility to do everything in their power to bring the world under the control of Islam. Now, we know that depending on the culture and depending on the teachers and depending on the interpretation, is that done peacefully or is that done forcefully? Uh, we've seen both approaches in the history of the world and the history of Islam. Whether that bringing the world under Islam is to be done with persuasion or to be done with the sword. So, but in the Muslim mind, all the world is either under Islam or under contention, under war, to be brought under Islam. So, Muhammad dies in 632 AD with no clear direction as to who is to be his successor. Um, and the word successor, successor to the prophet, successor to the messenger, the word in Arabic for successor is a word that we have probably heard before. It is the word caliph. Caliph. A caliph is a successor to Muhammad. And one who then establishes a territory, uh, that caliph, that territory that is under his control and under the control of Islam is called a caliphate. Caliphate. Uh, some of us have heard that terminology in the news because the leader of ISIS, uh, al-Baghdadi, has declared himself a caliph and has declared that he is starting a caliphate, uh, centered first in Syria and Damascus and then expanding outward. He has declared a caliphate. Now, most Muslims, of course, deny that al-Baghdadi has any legitimate claim to call himself a caliph and deny the methods of ISIS. But that's where you've heard the terminology in the news. So, back to 632. Who will be the caliph? Who will be the successor to Muhammad? It boils down, really, to two principal candidates to be the successor to Muhammad. One is his good friend and close companion, a man by the name of Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr was one of the first converts to Muhammad's new faith, his new religion. When Muhammad received these revelations, or said that he received these revelations in the cave, um, the first person he told was his wife, the wealthy widow that was 15 years his senior, she said, yes, that's true, you're not dreaming, you're not under a delusion, this is real. God has chosen you as his messenger. And as Muhammad began to share this news, this revelation with just a few close friends, Abu Bakr was either the second or third person that he told, very quickly after his wife. So one of the first converts to Islam, a member of the same tribe as Muhammad, uh, a man who accompanied Muhammad when he left Mecca to go to Medina on the so-called flight to Medina as enemies gathered against him in Mecca because they didn't like his preaching against the, the pagan gods. They didn't like his preaching of one god. Abu Bakr accompanied Muhammad on that journey to Medina. Muhammad married Abu Bakr's daughter, Aisha who was his favorite wife after his first wife, the wealthy widow uh, that was his first wife. Well, after she passed away, Muhammad married Aisha, and Aisha became his favorite wife uh, after Khadijah, the wealthy widow that was his first wife. Muhammad appointed Abu Bakr to be the prayer leader when Muhammad was ill. So think about his credentials. One of the first converts to Islam, Muhammad is married to his daughter. Uh, this man has a strong claim to succeed Muhammad. But there is another person who also has a strong claim, and that is Ali. Ali is the son of Muhammad's uncle, the uncle who took Muhammad in when he was six years old. So Ali is his cousin. Not only is Ali Muhammad's cousin, and the son of the man who raised him, Ali marries Muhammad's daughter, Fatima. So Ali is both Muhammad's cousin and his son-in-law. 
So he has a very, very close connection to Muhammad. Um, he's a young man, though, when Muhammad dies. He's only 34 years of age. And so these are the two leading candidates to be the caliph, to be the successor to Muhammad. An inner circle of leaders confer, and they decide that the appropriate person to succeed Muhammad is Abu Bakr. Ali is not present for that conversation. Ali is passed over. And so Abu Bakr becomes the first caliph, the first successor. And Muslims, at least especially Sunni Muslims, and I'll talk about the difference between Sunni and Shia more later, but Sunni Muslims talk about the four rightfully guided caliphs. The four rightfully guided caliphs. Four successors to Muhammad. The first is Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr is the caliph. He becomes the caliph in 632 upon the death of Muhammad. He only has that title, though, for two years until 634. It's during this time of Abu Bakr's leadership of this new religion, this new movement called Islam, that there is, well, some dissension. Because, remember, Muhammad has united all the tribes and all the peoples of Arabia under his leadership. They have sworn allegiance to Muhammad. But, upon Muhammad's death, that, that oath, that allegiance ends. The, their allegiance was to him personally. And the reality is that as the entire continent converted to Islam, some of those conversions may not have been for religious reasons. Some of them were probably more for political reasons, safety reasons, as some of those tribes said, yes, we will become a part of this new religion. Well, upon Muhammad's death, some of those tribes, some of those leaders started to say, well, maybe we don't want to be a part of this religion anymore. Maybe we don't want to swear loyalty to the new leader. And some of those tribes had men who said, you know what? I'm the new messenger. I'm hearing from God. I am now the new leader. And so there were uprisings and potential rivals. Abu Bakr had to put those down. Uh, these in Muslim history are called the apostates, the ones that had to be put down. And Abu Bakr was successful in doing that, but dies only two years into his time as caliph. The second caliph that is chosen is a man by the name of Umar. Umar. The second rightly guided caliph. He also takes the title, in addition to the title of caliph, successor, he takes the title of amir, which means commander. Now, it's under him, it's under his leadership, Umar's leadership, that Islam continues its spread beyond the Arabian Peninsula into Palestine, into Syria, into Iraq, into Egypt, into Iran. These are the, at least the modern names of the territories where Muslim now conquers and spreads. And so Islam leaves, goes beyond the Arabian Peninsula into what we would call the Middle East and becomes a much larger piece of territory under Islamic control. Now, as Umar led armies into these territories, many of these territories were ruled by Christians. And this is the first time that formerly Christian territories come under Muslim control. And the Muslims have to decide how they're going to treat the Christians. As a matter of fact, in 637, the Muslim armies march on Jerusalem and conquer Jerusalem. And the Christian ruler of Jerusalem surrenders to the Muslims. And Umar and the other Muslim leadership at that time have to decide how are they going to treat Christians. Um, and what is established is what's usually called the Treaty of Umar. This is the principles for a Muslim ruler as to how that Muslim ruler will treat Christians and Jews. Now, if you remember from last time, the Quran differentiates between Christians and Jews and pagans. Pagans being people like those formerly in Arabia who worshipped multiple gods, a god of the wind, a god of the river, a god of the earth, a god of the sky, a god of the stars, a god of the moon, a polytheistic religion. The Quran says that Muslims share with Christians and Jews 
this understanding of monotheism, only one God. And so the Quran refers to Jews and Christians as people of the book. They, are the, they, they share the heritage of Abraham. And so the Quran talks about how is a Muslim ruler to treat Christians and Jews. And here are the rules that really are established under Umar. Uh, how are Christians and Jews to live under Muslim law? Well, here are some of the rules. They can no longer build any churches or synagogues. They can no longer proselytize or evangelize in any way. There can be no more conversions to Christianity or Judaism. Of course, Jews aren't really big on proselytizing. This is mainly against the Christians. They have to pay extra taxes. Christians and Jews who live in Muslim territories have to pay extra taxes. Why? Well, because they're not going to be serving in the Muslim army. And because they're not going to be serving in the Muslim army, um, they have to make up for that service by paying money. So Christians and Jews pay an extra tax. Uh, in addition to that, Christians and Jews living in Muslim territories have to wear clothing that signifies and shows that they're not Muslim, that they're Christian or Jewish. Um, when I was reading about that and thinking about that, it made me think about, uh, in much more recent history, how Jews in Poland and under Nazi control were forced to wear the Star of David uh, to show that they were Jews. When my wife and I traveled to Israel a couple of weeks ago, we went through the Holocaust Museum. And there you see the photographs from Germany and Poland where the Jews were pushed into the ghettos and then forced to wear the Star of David to show that they were different, that they were separate, that they were Jews. Well, under Umar and under these rules, this is how we're going to treat Jews and Christians under Muslim control, that same idea of marking them and... Uh, and making them pay extra taxes, and keeping them from uh, growing their religions. Now, the reason I kind of emphasize this Treaty of Umar, it is still today, now, remember this is 637, um, now 1,300 years plus later, this is still the principle, the foundation, as to how Muslims are to treat Christians in their countries. Um, if you go to many, at least more moderate Muslim-dominated countries, some of these same ideas, including extra taxes, not being able to build churches, not being able to evangelize, these are some of the same rules that are in place today. But this is called the Treaty of Umar. Uh, so Umar expands Islam uh, and you know, gains new territory and establishes guidelines how to, how to treat Christians and Jews, but uh, he, too, is assassinated. He, too, dies. Uh, he is assassinated in 644. And on his deathbed, he doesn't kill immediately, he's attacked and he dies on a deathbed. And uh, there is a consultation. Who should be the next caliph? And it boils down to two candidates, a fellow named Uthman and, remember, Ali. Ali's still a relatively young man. He's still a candidate. But the consultation chooses... Uthman. So Uthman is the third caliph, once again passing over Muhammad's son-in-law and cousin Ali. Uthman is the caliph from 644 to 656. Uh, I should have filled in the fact that uh, Umar is from 634 to 644. So Uthman is the new caliph. He's not a very effective caliph. He doesn't get much done uh, in his 12 years, and he also is assassinated. You can see this is a pretty dangerous business, being the caliph. When Uthman is assassinated, however, there are some who say that Ali was a part of the plot. It's never proven. Ali denies it, but there are some who suspect that Ali had something to do with Uthman's death and assassination. Well, now we've had three caliphs. Who is to be the fourth caliph? Finally, Ali is selected. So Ali, Muhammad's son-in-law and cousin, becomes the fourth caliph. And he is caliph from 656 to 660. Now, as I said, there was some suspicion around Ali for having something to do with Uthman's death. 
And this really begins a period of great dissension among the leadership of Islam. Muhammad's wife, Aisha, opposes Ali. There are battles. There are what we might call a civil war brewing inside of Islam. And Ali, again, I said it's rather dangerous to be the caliph. Ali is assassinated in 661. And Ali's assassination in 661 really is a defining moment in the rise and history of Islam because it begins to cement this division between the followers of Ali, the ones who thought he should have been caliph all along, and those who opposed Ali. Now, when Ali is killed, he has had children. He has a son, Hussein. You know, we, some of these names that we hear, like, wait a minute, I, I've heard that name. Yes, Muhammad's grandson, Ali's son. Remember, Ali married Muhammad's daughter, so their son is Muhammad's grandson. His name is Hussein. Hussein begins to be a part of the fight, of uh, this sort of civil war inside of Islam. And Hussein is also killed, this time in battle. But when Hussein, Muhammad's grandson, Ali's son, is killed in battle, the commander of the other side not only kills him, he beheads him and takes his head and ships his head back to the Sunni leader. Um, this creates horrible bad feelings. And two of the most important shrines for Shiite Muslims are the place where Ali was killed and the place where Hussein was killed. Um, the, both of these are in Iraq. Um, Hussein is killed in a city in Iraq called Karbala. And Karbala becomes one of the most holy sites for Shiite Muslims. Now just to recap, uh, I mentioned last time we have two parties, two factions in Islam, the Sunni and the Shia. The, the Sunni are those who, the word Sunni means tradition. The Sunni believe that the successors to Muhammad are chosen from the companions and from those who a council of elders and leaders believe this is the person who will follow the traditions of Muhammad most faithfully. The Shiites are those who said the leadership should have stayed in the family. Shiite means the party of Ali. And this dissension over who should succeed Muhammad is what defines the, the conflict and the division between Sunni tradition and Shia, party of Ali. Uh, this division between Shia and Sunni is one that is still one of the defining characteristics of Islam today. And one of the things that makes it even more complicated and difficult is that one of the traditions, one of the hadiths about Muhammad, here's a quote of Muhammad. He said, really foretelling the future, Muhammad said, my community will be fragmented into 73 sects, S-E-C-T-S, sects. My community will be fragmented into 73 sects, and all of them will be in hellfire except for one. Seventy-three sects, and all of them will be in hellfire except for one. So Muhammad is really saying there, I foresee that my people, Muslims, will be fragmented and, and divided into different sects and groups, and all of them are going to be wrong except one. All of them are going to go to hell except one. And so, when you look at the fragmentation Within Islam, everyone thinks they are the right one, and everyone thinks all the other ones are going to hell. All the other groups are wrong. All the other groups are heretics, or as they would say, infidel. Infidel, not no faith. Um, someone who is outside of Islam, someone who is not a true Muslim. Um, this division... Well, Shiites, as I say, consider that Ali should have been the caliph all along. So Shiites say that the first three caliph are illegitimate. Matter of fact, part of Shiite ritual, part of Shiite prayers include cursing these three men. Think about that. 
Part of Shiite religious practice includes cursing the first three successors to Muhammad. Sunnis consider these three to be holy men. Sunnis consider these three to be great leaders. Sunnis consider these men to be the true holy successors to Muhammad. And yet the Shiites curse them as part of their prayers. And to think of this as a Christian analogy, I mean, because, of course, we as Christians have divisions. Um, There are hundreds of divisions in the body of Christ. There are hundreds of divisions among churches. There are the big divisions between Greek Orthodox and Catholic that goes back to a thousand years after Christ. There's the Protestant Reformation uh, from about 500 years ago, 1517, between Protestant and Roman Catholic. And then we Protestants, just think about how many divisions within Protestantism. Lutherans and Episcopalians and Methodists and Presbyterians and Baptists and Assembly of God and hundreds of non-denominational churches and on and on and on and on. Now, think if when you were visiting a, a Catholic church, part of the liturgy was to curse Martin Luther, John Calvin, and John Wesley. Think about how you would feel is if you went into a Catholic worship service and they were cursing Protestant leaders. You, you'd be highly offended. Well, now realize that for a Sunni, if they hear a Shiite cursing the men that they consider to be the great spiritual leaders, the great successors to Muhammad, how offensive that would be. If you're a Shiite and you say, these three men stole the leadership from the rightful leader, Muhammad's own son-in-law, his his daughter's husband, his cousin, the the son of his beloved uncle. This happened more than 1,300 years ago, and yet for Sunni and Shia, it's like it happened last week. The, The wound is still very fresh. The resentment is still very fresh. The graves of Ali and Hussein are holy to Shiite, because they say this is where they were martyred by the Sunni. This is where they were martyred by the enemies. And so this becomes something that informs the way in which the Muslim world interacts in these two divisions of Sunni and Shia. Now, at that point, uh, let me pause for a second to to talk a little bit about um, modern division between Sunni and Shia. And uh, we're going to put a little something up on the screen at this point. Uh, And what you'll see on the screen as I'm talking is a map of the current Middle East. Now, this doesn't include large places where Muslim populations like Indonesia. But uh, this is the map of the Middle East. And you'll notice, if you look at this map, that the red areas are the predominantly Shiite areas. And the, the less red, the more yellowy and white, Uh, the more Sunni area. Uh, Shiites only make up about 15% of worldwide Muslims. Places like Indonesia are almost entirely Sunni. It is only in the Middle East that we have a large percentage of Shia, of Shiite population. And you look at some of these countries, and you look, for example, at Iran. Iran has the highest percentage of Shiite. It is 90% Shiite only 9% Sunni. You look there at at Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia is 95% Sunni and only 5% Shia. You look at a place like like Iraq, Iraq is 63% Shia, 34% Sunni. Now, why is this important today? Well, if you're like, you know, a lot of us back in the early days of the Gulf War, uh, in the early days of the first Iraq War, and you'd hear these terms Sunni and Shia, and for most of us in the West, for most Christians, we didn't really understand, it just didn't make much sense to us why these different, we thought of them, okay, these are different denominations, but, and that's what we related it to. We didn't understand the deep divisions, we didn't understand just how important these divisions were. But take, for example, Iraq, where we spent uh, a lot of money and a lot of lives. Iraq 
was ruled for many years by Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein was Sunni. But he was ruling a population that was majority Shia. Iraq is 63% Shia, only 34% Sunni. But the leader, Saddam Hussein, was Sunni. So there was huge resentment against him for favoring Sunnis and persecuting Shia. Saddam Hussein is toppled with our help. The new government installed in Iraq is Shia. The Shia government now excludes Sunnis from all leadership posts. All the generals are now Shiite. All the leaders, all the cabinet positions, everyone is now Shiite. And now it's the Sunnis, the 30-some-odd percent of Sunnis who feel on the outside. Not only that, the new leaders of Iraq are Shiite, and because of that, they look naturally to their Shiite neighbors in Iran for leadership, for um, a treaty, for cooperation. Because the fact that their neighbors in Iran are Shiite are to them very important. That causes the rise of a Sunni insurgency against the Shiite leadership. And, and you, know, you see all these insurgencies and groups that are rebelling against the leadership. Often it has to do with this split between Sunni and Shia. So we'll come back to that, that division between Sunni and Shia again. But, but the division in Islam between Sunni and Shia goes all the way back to the death of Muhammad, to that very first decision as to who will succeed him as caliph. Is it going to be Abu Bakr? Is it going to be Ali? And Shiites say it should have been Ali, and they resent the first three caliphs. Sunnis say no. Those three caliphs were chosen by God, and they were rightful, and they were correct, and they followed the tradition, the Sunnah. And that creates a hostility that is still there today. Now, um, let's talk a little bit about um, some other things. A, um, uh, for Sunnis, a, an imam, you've heard the term imam, for Sunnis, an imam is simply a word that means prayer leader, imam. Sometimes these terms mean something different for a Sunni or for a Shia. For a Sunni, the word imam is just a word for the person who leads the prayers. Imam. But for a Shia... An imam is much more than a prayer leader. For a Shia, an imam is a community leader who is both the political and the religious leader. Shiite Muslims believe that imams receive special guidance from angels. And Shiite theology, Shiite belief, differs from Sunni belief. Of course, any two groups that are separated now for 1,300 plus years, you would expect the religion of Sunni, Christ, of Sunni Muslims and Shiite Muslims to diverge, just like Catholic and Protestant theology is different. Well, Shiite and Sunni religion is different. And one of the distinctives of Shiite Islam, remember Shiites are only 15% of worldwide Muslims, uh, but very significant because of their leadership of Iran and Iraq, Shiite Muslims believe that there have been 11 imams, 11 world Muslim leaders. They would say the first was Ali. They would say the second was Hussein, Muhammad's grandson. They would say that there were nine more after Hussein, nine more imams in a succession of these imams guided by angels. The 11th imam dies. There is no obvious child or successor to the 11th imam. But Shiites teach that indeed there was a 12th imam, a child born, named Muhammad al-Mahadi. And he is the 12th imam. They teach that he was born in the 9th century AD and still is alive today in hiding, waiting to be revealed. So Shiites believe that this 12th imam, this 12th leader 
of Islam, was born in the ninth century. He's still alive today, so he's over a thousand years old. He is in hiding, waiting for the end of days to reappear. Now, this is more than just kind of an odd little legend. If you look at the official leadership of the country of Iran, it will list as the head of state the 12th Imam, that this thousand-year-old-plus man who's in hiding is listed as being the head of state of Iran. I said his name, according to legend, is Muhammad al-Mahadi. He is sometimes simply called the Mahadi, which is analogous to our word for Messiah. And in Shiite teaching, this 12th Imam, this Mahadi, will appear at the end of days. Now, you think about Shiite thought, and much of their history is martyrdom. Ali is martyred. Hussein is martyred. And there is mourning that on the day in which Hussein is, is martyred in battle and beheaded and, and his body abused, that followers did not rise up to defend him. So there's a sense of guilt about that and a sense that part of Shiite ritual is, is self-beating because of the fact that faithful Shiites did not come to Hussein's defense. You'll see sometimes on Shiite holidays, men literally with whips whipping themselves on the back. That's all in penitence for not rising up to defend Hussein. The theme of martyrdom, the theme of suffering, the theme of injustice runs through Shiite Islam. Um, and their holy days and their holy sites are often related to the idea of martyrdom, suffering, injustice. Um, and that informs a lot of how Shiites view themselves in relation to Sunni. They see themselves as oppressed. They see themselves as being unjustly treated by the larger group. Of, of Muslims, the Sunni. Now, also they have some different religious practices. And one Shiite practice is one which Sunnis find offensive. And that is the, the Shiite practice of what's called temporary marriage. And uh, for at least a large section of Shia, the idea is that a man can have a temporary marriage with a woman for 24 hours. A man can be married, and he can be on a journey, and he has the desire uh, for sex. Um, he can temporarily marry a woman for 24 hours, and then at the end of the 24 hours, that marriage is dissolved. But for the 24 hours of the temporary marriage, um, sex is legitimate within that marriage. Now, you know, we might simply say it's just an excuse for adultery or even prostitution, but that's not how Shias see it. They see it as a way to keep a man's urges under something that is appropriate and legal. Uh, but Sunnis find this distasteful, and frankly, they see right through it. Um, I've mentioned before that while well, Muslims are required to give 2.5% of their income, 1 40th of their income, for the advancement of Islam and for the help of the poor. Shiites have to give 20% of their income to a mullah. Now, what is a mullah? A mullah is a leader, uh, a, a religious leader. And in Shiite, a, a mullah is a religious teacher, and it's sort of a pyramid. A mullah goes through training to be able to teach the Quran, to be able to lead prayer services, to be able to have both political and religious leadership. But if you're, I'm a mullah, I've got another mullah over me. And that mullah has another mullah over him. There's a hierarchy of mullahs. Um, and in Shiite, you get to the very top of that pyramid. Uh, this mullah is under this mullah, and he's under this mullah, and he's under this mullah. You get to the very top of the pyramid, there's only a handful. There's only a couple, a very few mullahs at the very top. And there's a special word for those mullahs at the very, very top. They are called an ayatollah. An ayatollah. So an ayatollah is a mullah at the very top of the food chain. 
And again, of course, we've heard the term Ayatollah as it relates to Shiite uh, uh, Islam. Primarily, most of us heard the term Ayatollah probably for the first time back in the late 70s when the Shah of Iran, who was overthrown, he was backed by the West, the Shah of Iran was overthrown and replaced by a mullah, by an Ayatollah, the Ayatollah Khomeini. Uh, and most of us who were alive in the late 70s and up until the early 80s can remember the face of the Ayatollah Khomeini, this man who became the face of Iran during the hostage crisis when the American embassy was overrun by the, by the Iranian students and the American uh, workers there were held uh, captive for 444 days and then finally freed um, the day that Ronald Reagan was sworn in as president. Um, most of us remember that was our first exposure to the whole idea of an Ayatollah, the Ayatollah Khomeini. There is a different Ayatollah who is now the supreme leader of Iran. And again, Iran has elected officials, Iran has a secular president, but all of them have to answer to the Ayatollah. The Ayatollah, also Khomeini, not the same one, a different Ayatollah Khomeini. The Ayatollah of Iran is the supreme leader. He has the final say. He can veto anything that the politicians agree to. During the recent negotiations between America and Iran over the nuclear disarmament of Iran, the negotiators from Iran's side could do anything you know, they could work on it and make deals and all that, but everything they did had to eventually be approved by the Ayatollah. He had the final word. He had the final say. Because in Shiite Islam, the religious leader and the political leader are the same person. The mullah, or in this case, the Ayatollah, the supreme mullah, has absolute authority because Shia believe that he is chosen by God, that he is guided by angels, that he indeed is the supreme authority. Um, and that's different. You know, there are no ayatollahs in Sunni Muslim. Um, now, I, I keep talking about this hatred or this at least uh, friction between Sunni and Shia in much of the Muslim world. Why, why is there such friction? Why is there such animosity? Well, a lot of it has to do, as I said, these the martyrdom of Ali and Hussein is something that for Shia is as fresh as yesterday. Um, a couple of hundred years ago, in 1802, a group of Sunnis, of Wahhabi Sunnis, and that is the brand of Sunnism, because even within Shiite and Sunni, there are lots of subdivisions. Um, Saudi Arabia is primarily Sunni, and it is a particular type of very strict Sunnism called Wahhabi Sunnism. The royal family of Saudi Arabia, they are Wahhabi Sunnis. But 200 years ago, Wahhabi Sunnis from Saudi Arabia destroyed the shrine of Hussein in Karbala, Iraq, killing 2,000 people and destroying this monument to Hussein. Well, again, that happened just 200 years ago and is a very fresh wound for Shia against Sunni. You see, when you look at the map of uh, the modern Middle East, you realize there are two significant powers. Saudi Arabia and Iran. Saudi Arabia is the leading Sunni power. Even though it doesn't uh, have as many people as some of the other countries, it has the wealth and the power. Saudi Arabia is the leading Sunni power. Iran is the leading Shiite power in the Middle East. And they do not like each other. There is great competition between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Um, there's great animosity there. <clears throat> and for those of us in the West who tend to kind of blur all that, uh, we can get into big trouble, as I said before, if you, if you refer to um, an Iranian as an Arab. Iranians are not Arabs. Iranians are Persians. And so not only are, are the religions in Saudi Arabia and Iran different, the, the racial heritage is different. Saudi Arabia is an Arab nation. Iran is a Persian nation. They're both Muslim, but different kinds of Islam and different ethnic backgrounds. Um, as I said, this hostility has to do with the legitimacy of the first three caliphs that Sunnis say are legitimate, that Shiites say are usurpers and illegitimate. Uh, I mentioned how Sunnis think that the temporary marriage 
doctrine of, of Shiites is, is silly. Um, now, uh, is it clear cut that you know Sunni and Shia always trump other interests? No. There can be all kinds of compromises. In some countries, Shia and Sunni live peacefully next door to each other. In America, Shia and Sunni will attend the same mosque. Um, and you say, how can that be? Well, think about it. In places like America, Muslims are very much the minority. And when you're very much the minority, a fellow Muslim uh, is someone you're going to reach out to even though you have doctrinal differences. Um, think about if you were an American Christian living in Saudi Arabia. Um, you would reach out to other Christians. You wouldn't care if they were Catholic, Baptist, or, or whatever. Um, if you were a Methodist in Saudi Arabia and there was a handful of other Christians there, you wouldn't care about uh, some of those doctrinal differences that we have with, with Roman Catholics or Southern Baptists or anybody else. You would just be glad to be with another Christian in, in an environment surrounded by Muslims. Well, reverse that. If you're a Muslim living in a Western country, those divisions become much less important here. Um, and you're much more likely to gravitate to each other because you see yourselves as a minority. If you're in a place like Iran or Iraq where everyone's a Muslim, those, those differences between Sunni and Shia, those ancient resentments, those, those ancient hostilities uh, are much more significant, just like you know, not that long ago in Northern Ireland, uh, the resentment between Protestant and Catholic was violent and, and deep and visceral. The hatred between Catholic and Protestant in Norman, Northern Ireland was, was leading to bombings and killings. We realized it wasn't all theological. There was a lot of other factors, political factors thrown into that. It's the same way in the Muslim world. The hatred between Shiite and Sunni in one country is different from this country, and the politics and economics and racial and all kinds of other things play into that. It's not, none of it's as clear cut or as simplistic as we probably would like to make it. Now, having put some of those differences between Sunni and Shia, let's talk about some of the consensus about what Muslims believe and some of the belief systems of Islam. Um, the so-called pillars of faith. Um, one thing that all Muslims share uh, as an absolute bedrock belief is that God is one, this idea of monotheism. Remember, Muhammad's whole reason for resenting the culture he was brought up in was he hated all the pagan gods. He hated all the idols. Muhammad preached strict monotheism. There is only one God. And that's one reason Muslims look at us as Christians and target us and say, you Christians believe in three gods. You see, for a Muslim, our doctrine of the Trinity is very offensive. Muslim would point at us and they say, you Christians, you believe that God is three. You believe in three gods. You're not really true monotheists. You're, and they see our teaching of the Trinity, God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as offensive. Uh, they say that is the sin of shirk, which is an a Arabic word that means association. They say, God has no mother, God has no father, God has no brother, God has no sister, God has no son, God has no daughter. And they believe that our teaching that Jesus is God's son is offensive. When my wife and I, Janine and I, were in the Holy Land a couple of weeks ago, we were taken to a place that is the traditional site of the upper room. Um, now, often in the Holy Land, when they say, here's the traditional site of something, you say, is there, do we know absolutely positively sure that this is where these events happened? And usually not. This room, was this actually where the Last Supper took place? Possibly, but you know, there's, there's some doubt about it. But this is where they take folks and say, here's the traditional site of the upper room, which is a neat place to go and visit. But that building has passed through multiple owners across the centuries, including some Muslim owners. And they have not torn down the things that previous groups have put on the walls. And mounted on the wall in, in, in tile is Arabic. And Arabic saying on the wall is, God has no son. 
This was put there by Muslims as a way to say to Christians, your belief is wrong. God doesn't have a son. And so if you visit the upper room, you'll see this sign. Now, it's in Arabic, so you, you know, unless somebody tells you that's what it says, it won't probably bother you. But our belief in the Trinity is one of the major reasons Muslims view Christians as inferior. Um, they would say that we are kafir. Kafir is a word that really means someone whose belief in God is flawed. Whether you're an atheist or a Christian or a Jew or, or a Buddhist, you are kafir. You, your, your view of God is wrong. So strict, strict monotheism is the bedrock of Islam. Muslims also believe, have a great deal of theology about angels. Um, the Quran talks an awful lot about angels, much more than our Bible talks about angels. Uh, in the Quran, angels are God's messengers. Uh, they are guardians. The Quran says that every human being has two guardian angels assigned to them. Um, the Quran talks about uh, Iblis, that we would call Satan, a, a fallen angel, an angel who refused... When God created the first human, Adam, God wanted the angels to bow down because here is a, someone created in the image of God, which the angels were not. Iblis, a.k.a. Satan, refused to bow down and was cast out of heaven because of that. The Quran also talks about jinn, not the alcoholic drink, J-I-N-N, jinn, which is where we get our word genie. Jinn and the Quran are sort of sprites, fairies. They'd be analogous to leprechauns or trolls or other sort of mythical beings. But the Quran says that jinn can be good or evil. Um, they have their own kings and their own marriages and their own society, but they're usually invisible. They're beings made of fire. There's lots of legends about the jinn, which would, again, probably be analogous to a lot of folk tales in Western culture about various creatures like, like fairies and trolls and leprechauns and things like that. Um, the, uh, the Quran talks about there being four books that came from God. Moses, the books of the law, David, the Psalms, Jesus, the Gospels, and then the Quran. But they say that the Quran is perfect and the other three books are corrupted. They say that either by intention or by accident, we, we Jews and Christians have corrupted the sacred text. And that if we had the uncorrupted version of the laws of Moses and the Gospels and the Psalms, they would match perfectly with the Koran. The Koran, they say, is perfect. And therefore, anywhere the Quran disagrees with our scriptures, the Quran is right, because they say the Quran is directly dictation from God, and that our books have been abridged, corrupted, changed. So you might think, well, Muslims must be interested to read our, our Bible then. No, they won't read our Bible. They say, why would I read a corrupted version when I have the perfect version in the Quran? Why would I read the wrong version when I have the perfect right version in front of me? So most Muslims have no interest in reading our scriptures because they say the Quran has the stories in a more perfect form. Um, the Quran lists 28 different prophets, of which Muhammad is the final and greatest. Um, but the second greatest prophet in the Quran is Jesus. Jesus is lifted up very high in the Quran, just not as high as we would say that he is. For Muhammad and for the Quran, Jesus is the second greatest prophet. The Quran affirms the virgin birth, but the Quran says Jesus did not die on the cross. You see, Muhammad says, and the Quran says, that God would never allow his great prophet to be killed. So the Quran says that we Christians get it wrong when we say that Jesus died on the cross. The Quran says, no, no, no. At the last minute, Jesus was taken up into heaven and a look-alike was crucified. That the person who was crucified was somebody who looked like Jesus, but it wasn't Jesus. That the real Jesus, according to the Quran, was taken up into heaven, where he still lives today. And the Quran says that someday, at the end of time, Jesus will return to earth. That he will battle the Antichrist. 
uh, that he will live on earth for 40 years, that he will then die, that he'll be buried next to Muhammad, and that both of them will be raised at the last day. So what the Quran says about Jesus is, of course, very, very different from what the New Testament says. Um, so on the one hand, they have a very high vision of Jesus, but they believe that we Christians have the story totally wrong, and they believe especially our doctrine that he was the Son of God and our doctrine of the Trinity they find uh, not only wrong, but they find offensive. Now, the Quran does talk quite a bit about judgment, the last judgment. It talks a lot about heaven and hell. But the way the Quran talks about heaven and hell is quite a bit different from the way we think about heaven and hell. Um, the Quran says there are seven levels of heaven, seven levels of hell. And the worse person you are, the lower the level of hell. The better person you are, the higher the level of heaven. So we've got 14 possible destinations in the afterlife. Um, there's a very detailed description in the Quran and in the Hadith of what happens when you die. Um, and the Quran, you know, I've talked to my sermons a few weeks ago about the idea of predestination. Um, the Quran is very much about predestination. Everything is planned by God. Everything is predetermined by God. God has planned everything out, which is why if you go to a Muslim country, um, they will, you will hear the phrase, inshallah, over and over and over again. Inshallah means if God wills it. So everything is dependent upon if, God, if that's part of God's plan. So if you're meeting a friend who's Muslim and you say, oh, you know, what time should we meet? He'll say, I'll meet you at 2 o'clock, inshallah. In other words, I'll meet you at 2 o'clock if God wills it. Because he might not. It might not even be part of his plan. Um, you know, what are you going to... You know, what are you going to do tomorrow? Well, I'm going to go get my car fixed, inshallah, if God wills it. So everything is predetermined. Everything is predestined. But guess what? The Quran also says that you are totally responsible for all your sins. And as we say, there's, there's a logical problem with that. If God has predestined everything, including all of your deeds and actions, then how can God hold you responsible for all of your sins? Well, Muslim... Scholars don't have a really good answer for that. They just say, you are. Um, and so angels play a big part in the final judgment. Um, there's, uh, and angels, let me talk about angels just because as we're talking about heaven and hell, their role in all this is, is important. Uh, the Quran says that angels have intellect but no sensuality. Animals have sensuality but no intellect. Humans have both. And so angels... Um, are not made in God's image, but they are messengers of God. Um, the role of angels is to bring God's messages, is to guard places like heaven and hell. They hold up the throne of God. As I said, each person has two guardian angels. There are four archangels in the Quran. Gabriel, the most important, the one who dictates the Quran to Muhammad. Michael, who along with Gabriel are the ones that, if you remember from last week, tore open baby Muhammad's chest, pulled out his heart, got rid of the sin, stuck it back in there, healed it back up. Um, and two with the names that sound very similar. One whose name is Israel, which sounds a lot like Israel, but it's not. The angel of death in, uh, in Muslim, in Islam. And Israfil, who's going to blow the trumpet at the last day. There are also... Two other very important angels in the Quran, Munkar and Nakir. Munkar and Nakir. These are the angels that interrogate you in the grave. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But Munkar and Nakir are the angels whose job it is to interrogate every dead person in the grave after they die. Um, so, um, let's talk about what happens according to the Quran after you die. According to the Quran, 40 days after your death, there's a, a tree under the throne of God with the name of every human being on a leaf. 40 days after you die, a, a leaf falls from that tree and lets the angels know that you have died and that angel is sent to interrogate you. Um, so 40 days after you die, as you're in your grave, 
and the angel of death shows up to pull your soul out of your body. Um, then you are tempted to abandon your faith, uh, and if you can withstand that temptation, you're given a glimpse of heaven and hell. Then your soul is stuck back in your body, and 40 days after you're dead, you sit up in your grave, in the ground. And you are there interrogated by Munkar and Nakir. And they start by saying, who is your Lord? And they, they begin this interrogation to determine your eternal destiny. Now here, here's one thing that's interesting. If you're a martyr, at this point you go straight to heaven. Everybody else has to suffer through the interrogation and all these other things. But if you're a martyr, at this point you get to go straight to paradise, straight to heaven. But everybody else stays in, in the grave. And you're actually pressure. You, you feel the pressure of the dirt on you. You, you feel the, the weight of the grave on you for up to 40 days. Then you become unconscious. And you lay there in an unconscious state until the day of resurrection. So the only people who get to go to paradise immediately are martyrs. Then the Quran says at the end of time, at the day of judgment, Nature will go crazy, the sun will rise in the west, all kinds of crazy things will happen, the Antichrist will come, Jesus will return, the tr angels will blow the trumpets. You know, it's kind of similar to some of the things we see in Revelation. But then everyone is resurrected, and the final judgment takes place. But the final judgment is very different in, Muslim, in Islam from, from Christianity. It's a scale, and every person has been interrogated and their deeds of their whole life have been written down and the good deeds are put on one side of the scale, the evil deeds are put on the other side of the scale and whichever side is heavier determines whether the person goes to heaven or person goes to hell. Uh, and so in Islam there is no guarantee of salvation. There's no knowing if you're going to go to heaven or hell until, until after you die because you know, you have to, they have to measure up your good deeds and measure up your bad deeds. Now, you probably would try very hard to make sure you got a lot of good deeds uh, so you can have some peace to know that you're okay. But you, the, the, the scales are loaded with good deeds and bad deeds, and then everybody gets on a bridge. And here's the, frankly, kind of scary, creepy-sounding part. You get on the bridge, and, and the righteous, the people who are going to heaven, the bridge is wide and well-lit, and the people walk across this wide, well-lit bridge all the way to the gates of paradise. But for others, the bridge gets narrower and narrower and narrower and darker and darker until the bridge becomes like a razor. And the people trying to walk on the edge of the razor, of course, inevitably fall off into the pits of hell. Uh, and so you start off on the bridge, and depending on what happens, you either walk into paradise or you fall into hell. Um, and who goes to what level of hell is also described. Um, the top level of hell is for Muslims, but just kind of bad Muslims, and actually, the Quran says that some of those who are in the top level of hell may eventually actually make the jump into heaven. They, there might be some chance for them to get out of hell through the mercy of God and the intercession of Muhammad. Um, you go down lower and you get to the pagans and, and the people like us who are not Muslims, and the, the lowest level of hell is reserved for the hypocrites, uh, which is the people who pretended to be Muslim but really weren't. They're in the lowest level of hell, They'll never escape. There's no escape. They have to, the, the tortures that are described for the hypocrites are pretty gruesome. They drink molten brass. Um, their skin is burned off and then it regrows and the skin is burned off and it regrows. I mean, it's, it's pretty grisly kind of stuff. Heaven, however, is described as an amazing place. Uh, Al-Jana, which means the garden. Um, and you, you read the Muslim description, the, the Quranic description of heaven, and it, it very much seems like a place that a, a desert people would imagine as paradise. It is a place that is green and lush, 
There are four rivers running through paradise. A river of water, a river of honey, a river of milk, and a river of wine. And these, so that everybody, you know, can just fill your goblet at any time. But you never get drunk. You can drink wine all day and you never get drunk. Everybody is wearing silk. Everybody's lounging on couches and uh, attended by servants. And, and again, some of us in the West have heard, of course, that every man... Um, in paradise, has 70 or 72 virgins who are there to meet all of his sexual desires. Um, and uh, you know, this gets a lot of play, of course, um, in, you know, when we found out about a lot of the suicide bombers and the promise that was given to them, you know, as soon as you kill yourself, as long as you take some infidel with you, you'll immediately be in paradise, you'll immediately be surrounded by the 72 virgins who will you know, meet your every desire. Um, these 72 virgins are actually not human. Uh, they're, the word for them in Arabic is horis, uh, which uh, their skin is so fair as to be almost translucent. Uh, they have large black eyes, um, but they are there to, to pleasure and meet every desire of a Muslim man. So a Muslim man has his wives and his 72 virgins on top of that. Um, in later times, of course, the question has arisen, what about the women? What about faithful Muslim women? Do they get something that's equated to that? You know, do they get a reward as well? And uh, the only answer that seems to come is, well, the Quran is too modest to describe that. But um, very much a male-dominated picture of paradise. Uh, and, and it's funny how the things that are forbidden in this life are in plenty in paradise, like wine and multiple women and, and sexual pleasure, etc. cetera. Um, and, and when you read about that, you know, I, I think a lot of us in the West, when we hear about suicide bombers, we, we think, well, these people are, are crazy. You know, we think they're insane. Well, no, you have to realize how, how much religious fever and religious fervor can make you do things that seem crazy. Picture a young Muslim teenage boy living in a country where there's turmoil, where there's poverty, where there's no hope for a future, where things are horrible, and a a religious leader tells this young man that if he will become a martyr, if he will stand up for Islam against the Crusaders, which is the way they still refer to Westerners, against the great Satan of America and Israel, if he will fight for the rights of his people by, by killing Crusaders, that he will immediately be transported to paradise where all of these amazing things will happen to him for all eternity. Um, you see the lure of that. Um, someone was asking me at the, at the Wednesday night lesson, um, you know, well, you know, how does this sort of brainwashing happen to convince uh, people to commit horrible acts of violence like this? Well, one, remember, um, the Quran has verses that can be taken all different ways. There are people who say, well, the Quran teaches peace and tolerance. Some of the verses of the Quran do teach peace and tolerance, especially the early verses. When Muhammad was very much in the minority, when he was a persecuted preacher in Mecca, the verses of the Quran that were received by Muhammad in those early days are a lot about peace and tolerance. The later verses of the Quran, and when I say later, I mean chronologically later, because they're not arranged chronologically, but the, the verses of the Quran that are from the later period of Muhammad's life, when he was in charge, when he was the ruler, are much stricter about how to treat unbelievers, about how to treat non-Muslims. So if you go to the Quran, can you find verses that talk about tolerance and love and peace and acceptance? Yes, you can find those verses. Um, can you find verses in the Quran that talk about um, going after your enemies and going after anyone who's not Muslim and forcing people to be under Islam? Yes, you can find those verses too. Uh, remember, the word uh, Islam means submission. 
It means submission. But also remember that the vast majority of Muslims can't read the Quran anyway, because the Quran is written in Arabic, and it is forbidden to translate the Quran out of Arabic. Any translation of the Quran in any other language is technically illegal. Now, you can get around that because often they have a, what amounts to a translation of the Quran, but they refer to it as a commentary. Um, and it kind of gets around the idea of if it's forbidden to translate the Quran. So, uh, but still, most Muslims have never read the Quran, even in a translation. Most Muslims simply have heard a preacher, an imam, a mullah, I mean, someone tell them, this is what it says. And this is what you should do. And they don't question that preaching. They're simply told by a religious authority figure, the Quran says if you will be a martyr, you'll go to paradise. The Quran says that if you kill yourself and take the enemy with you, that you're a martyr. Most of these people who do things that we find atrocious, because they are atrocious, they've never studied the Quran. They've only heard a radical, self-proclaimed preacher tell them this is what it says. And again, you think about the fact that Islam as a religion is 600 years younger than Christianity. You look back at our own history, um, and you see that there were times when Christians were told to do things by leaders that we know were not scriptural. The Crusaders, a thousand years ago, were told to go march into the Holy Land and kill every Muslim and every Jew that they saw. Um, and that was done in the name of Christ, in the name of the church. And we look back at that with horror. We look at the Inquisition, where uh, non-Christians were, were literally tortured to force them to convert to Christianity. And we say, that's, that's so unbiblical, that's so against everything Jesus taught. Most of the people who were involved in that had never read the scriptures. The scriptures weren't available to be read. This was before the inventing of the printing press. Most people couldn't read or write. Um, thankfully, we have advanced to the place where we can read the scriptures. Uh, we can read them in our own language. Um, we have access to uh, responsible Christian leaders and responsible Christian books. And, and, and the Church of Jesus Christ looks back at some of those days uh, with horror. There are many in the Muslim world who are in the place where Christianity was a thousand years ago in terms of their thinking. Uh, all they can think of is get rid of the enemy and make Islam supreme around the world. Um, one of the things I think is always important for us to remember is as Christians, we, we reject Muslim teaching. Uh, we would say the Quran is is not authoritative. We would dispute how it came into being. We would dispute Muhammad's testimony. We, we would not accept um, this. But we also have to remember that not all Muslims are the same. Um, and one of the things that we just want to remind everybody is in both Shia and Sunni, there are Shia and Sunni who, who are peaceful and uh, reasonable and gracious. And there are Shia and Sunni who are on the fringe and who uh, are willing to do horrible things. And there's all kinds of folks in between. Um, and I think like most people who are in our world who don't know Jesus Christ, you know, part of our goal is to reach out to them with the love and mercy and grace and compassion of Jesus Christ and let them know there's another way. Uh, I hope this has helped you understand a little bit more about the world situation and about the realm of Islam. And maybe if you have Muslim neighbors, maybe give you a deeper understanding of where they're coming from. And maybe when you watch the news, a few things will make more sense. Uh, we'll be doing this, uh, hopefully, for each of the six sessions. Um, we won't be doing one next week because it's Ash Wednesday. We'll be having a special service at the church on Ash Wednesday. But then uh, the following week, we'll be back with another lesson on Wednesday night. And I'll make another one of these tapes uh, shortly thereafter. Uh, we'll see you all later on. Thanks. God bless.